Hi, I'm Marcus Fares, founder and editor-in-chief of Design, and welcome to the final day of Design 15, our digital festival celebrating our 15th birthday. As part of this, we asked 15 creatives from around the world to come up with ideas for how to change the world over the next 15 years. Each day, they've presented their manifestos for a better world. Today, on the last day, we're speaking to architect and designer Neri Oxman about her proposal. Hi, Neri. Hey, Marcus. So good to be here. How are, How are you? you doing? I'm, I'm good. doing great. I'm great. Tell me, first of all, where are you? You look like you're in some empty warehouse somewhere. Yeah, so I'm in New York City, um, 78711, the location of our new office, uh, currently under construction. And we look forward to open our doors in, in about a year's time. Uh, so very excited to be giving this uh, interview with you in a, in a brand new space. And this is a big change for you, isn't it? You've, you've had a big life change. Tell us about what's happened and what you're doing. That's right. They say every 10 years, uh, your whole body, your whole cells are being replaced. You redefine your identity. So yes, I, uh, I, I relocated. I moved to another city. I became a mother, uh, which was probably the, you know, the biggest gift of all. Um, and I uh, moved from academia to practice. Uh, uh, left MIT, gave up my tenure. Uh, and I'm starting a new company uh, based here in New York City. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, you're, we described you, I described you just in as an architect and designer, but you're not like an average architect and designer, are you? Yeah, uh, uh, jack of all trades, master of none, as Ed <laughs> says. Um, and um, yeah, uh, uh, I, uh, let's see, architect, uh, uh, trained as an architect, uh, but also as a medical doctor, actually I went to medical school uh, before my architectural studies for several years, um, then tra transitioned into architecture uh, and studied um, yeah, my master's at the AA, my PhD at MIT, and I stayed as faculty um, and did a lot of science and engineering, actually. So I, I, do, uh, uh, I do count myself and my team members as inventors in addition to designers. It's been really uh, the core of our practice at MIT and, and still today um, to design not only products and objects and building structures, but also the technologies with which to create them. So we are in our heart of hearts uh, technologies as much as we are designers. And your new studio, which is called Oxman, will do what exactly? Tell us what the plan is for, the, for the, both the, the, the company and the space itself. Sure. So uh, I should clarify, Oxman is a placeholder name. It fits well for today's talk, OXMAN, Nature Times Humanity. Um, but we envision it as a kind of a, a, a Bell Labs of the 21st century. So um, the, the new space will hold uh, an architectural atelier. It will hold wet lab, BL2 wet labs, a biomechatronics shop, an electronics shop, a machine shop. Um, and so it will really be a, a place uh, where interdisciplinary design across scales, across uh, problem context and across domain can take, can take place. Um, so it's, it's, it's carrying through the same spirit of the mediated matter group, but this time uh, not, not stopping with speculative design, but looking into how might these designs actually contribute to a better world um, and tackling uh, real world commissions, uh, right? At, again, product scales and architectural and urban scales. And the manifesto that you've written as part of Design 15, how does that fit into your new studio? Is it, is it part of it? Is it part of the ethos of the studio? Yes, yes and yes, um, three times. So uh, I'd say that we, we are sort of seeking to design not only a new practice and a new studio, but a new way of doing design. Um, and that sort of means to realign um, the world of design and, and the world of nature. And we're defining ourselves as a, as a nature-centric design studio where nature is a co-client. Um, and by signing off on a project, one must sign off on this manifesto that we're about to present to you today um, that calls into question our relationship with nature today. What's so interesting about this relationship is that while we are um, such a small mass on the planet in terms of actual mass, right, plants, actually plants take up 90% of, of the mass on the planet, bacteria 5% and all the rest 5%. Um, the design objects that we've created over centuries, um, I'd say over the past 200,000 years, but especially over the past 200 years, um, have contributed to this divide between 
human activity, human impact on the planet and the natural world. Um, and although humans are part of the natural world, the design objects that we've created have now exceeded the amount of biomass on the planet. So that's a very, very sad moment for humanity. Uh, and so we're really looking to align humanity and nature, humans and nature, and sort of seek a world in which all the design goods that we produce um, are indistinguishable from the design goods of the natural world. Uh, in, in a world like that, there will be no uh, climate change and global warming risks and perils, but uh, it'll take time to get there. Sounds like a good moment for you to share your screen and, and tell us all about it and uh, present us your Sounds manifesto. Sounds great. Perfect. I will do so now. Um, all right. So here we go. Share. Yeah, right. I can see it now. There we are. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, so I'll start with this. Um, actually, I'm going to shift you a little bit so I can see the slides. Here we go. Yeah, so, so as I said, over the past 200 years, humankind's impact on the planet has instigated a climate disaster, escalated biodiversity loss, and intensified pandemic threats associated with commercial wildlife trade. For the first time in our planet's record, human design constructs, materials, products, buildings, and cities outweigh Earth's entire biomass. Although human beings are part of the natural world, human activity and the goods that we design and build from our clothes to our cities have increasingly set us apart from nature, negatively impacting ourselves and our planet. So we ask if life on earth is to survive, we must rethink our relationship with nature. And in a world where human made materials are designed as biocompatible, designed products are indistinguishable from naturally grown ones. The design goods that now divide us, wearables, cars, planes, rockets, buildings, cities, can reunite us. So in our group and also in our company, we seek to promote the relationship between nature and humanity from consumption on the one hand and preservation on the other to one that embodies complete and entire synergy between grown and made, between biology and technology, across all scales and across all kingdoms of life. By placing a multiplicity sign in the form of an X between nature and humanity, we call for a radical realignment between grown and built environments with the hope that humanity has the power not only to restore, recover, replenish the natural world, but also to empower it. Projecting 15 years forward, however, requires a sliver of looking back. So over the past 15 years, during my tenure at MIT, I've had the honor and pleasure to lead brilliant teams of architects and designers working hand in hand with scientists and engineers introducing them to the art of biological engineering, synthetic biology, and material ecology, a field that we ourselves pioneered and deployed throughout our work. On February of 2020, we had our first monograph show at the Museum of Modern Art. It was curated by the brilliant Paola Antonelli. And this coming February, exactly two years later, on the other side of the pandemic, we'll be holding our second monograph show at SFMOMA, uh, dedicated to our transition from academia to industry. This show is being curated by also brilliant Jennifer Dunlop Fletcher. So here's a brief outline of, of the upcoming slides examining our transition from academia to industry and from product scale to the architectural scale. So first from academia to practice. Inventing new technologies with which to make things has always been at the core of who we are as designers. Be it the glass printer, a fiber winding robot, a bio-based additive manufacturing technology, all of our design work to date, uh, without an exception, I believe, has been grounded in authoring new technologies and revealing scientific insights. Innovations in computational design have enabled us to computationally grow new forms, embodying self-organization, reproduction, and growth, as well as intelligence and agency, characteristics that emerge through biological growth processes that are found in nature. We develop data-driven material modeling to bridge the digital, physical, and biological divide combining parametric and volumetric modeling with very high resolution multi-material printing. It enabled us uh, with a physical visualization and the ability to design with complex data sets commonly associated with scientific imaging. 
So through data-driven material modeling, we designed objects with high resolution gradients of material properties, programmable materials uh, designed to embody mechanical property gradients, gradients in expansion associated with water affinity uh, and various other functional gradients that enable codependency between physical and digital and also the biological domains, fully integrated atoms, bits and genes that bring us closer together to growing things with both spatial and temporal functional variations. With these inventions in mind, we ask ourselves, how might we leverage design to mediate between nature and humanity? So I'll now take you through two projects illustrating scale transitions in two very, very different material systems. And you can find more about this on the film that we're releasing with you this morning. Uh, the first photopolymers, um, the Gemini Chez was one of our first designs to implement functional gradients using over 40 materials with preset mechanical combinations, varying in rigidity, opacity, and color as a function of geometrical, structural, and acoustical constraints. While the chaise forms a semi-enclosed space surrounding the body with a stimulation-free environment, the cinema um, that we're now designing takes this experience to the next level, augmenting soundproof-like conditions with high levels of light tunability. The cells composing the cinema determine the location, size, and orientation of the roof apertures, contributing to an integrated and holistic system across performative, structural, and functional elements. This work will also be shown for the first time at our SF MoMA show uh, this coming February. The second material system is biopigments. Our team has been in search of uh, materials and chemical substances that have so far endured the perils of climate change. Melanin is one sub such substance that can sustain and enhance biodiversity at the genetic, species, and ecosystem levels. The Biodiversity Pavilion leverages a data-driven material modeling approach for programmable melanin, utilizing pigment variation to account for controlled filtration of light and heat in order to protect and preserve the rare and precious species of Cape Town. To the left, a programmable melanin on installation scale at our MoMA show, and to the right, on architectural scale for SF MoMA. We've been honored to receive an endorsement from the Mandela Foundation as part of Design and Daba, and we look forward to re realizing this project um, very soon. It draws from the richness of species, combining old and new materials, glass and natural rock formations with biological pigments that are deri derived from fungi, plants, and microbial life. And in it, visitors will pay homage to the biodiversity of a thriving global metropolis that prioritizes and respects all human uh, and non-human life acting as a portable tome wall that cools down the space by absorbing heat from solar gain during the day and heats the space by radiating stored energy during the night. By utilizing thermal mass with hydrogels, the pavilion can passively regulate its immediate environment with bacteria, plants, animals, and humans as, it, as its ultimate users. Wrapping up with two of uh, Mediated Matter's final projects, um, as well as a speculative, speculative project in urban design scale, um, drawing on previous work uh, for the Museum of Modern Art, we have for some time invested in nature-centric design. In Silk Pavilion 2, 10 days of co-creation among silkworms, humans, and a robotic loom resulted in a structure made of silk threads longer than the diameter of planet Earth. Much of our work to date has involved biological systems embodying the emergence of self-organized patterns and behaviors. Simple rules encoded in DNA can drive the formation of materials from single cell to near infinite complexity, programmable growth. Here's some of our most recent work uh, spanning product architectural and urban scales. Those include novel technologies and computational approaches with which to design and construct, or I should say grow them. So product scale designed by emergence, uh, I'll start with synthetic apiary two. Uh, with synthetic apiary two, we studied how top-down design templating can augment and encourage the bottom-down social behavior of the bees that are associated with uh, comb building. 
We digitally reconstructed resulting wax, stru wax structures with high throughput X-ray CT, enabling a holistic examination of comb architecture. Think of it as precision medicine or precision evaluation of bee combs. We applied a variety of computational tools to rigorously analyze both the shape and the materiality of comb architecture and discovered how the direction of comb building influences and is influenced by the geodesic distances from underlying substrates. We demonstrated that even the direction of gravity can be reconstructed from CT scans of selected regions of the comb. Computational analysis was overlaid on constructed combs to visualize spatial variations in morphology or irregularity of wax structures. In future work, we provided colonies, um, in further research, sorry, we provided colonies with other variations of a designed environment in which to construct honeycomb sustainably, augmenting comb construction and honey generation. Applying an iterative design process, we conducted a multitude of experiments uh, explored across a range of materials and geometries with the aim of helping the bee community, the bee communities around the country and the world thrive uh, both on our planet, but also in deep space. Uh, what you're looking at is an autonomous biological laboratory environment designed for studying the impact of space flight on the sole reproductive node of a bee colony that was launched as part of New Shepard Blue Origin suborbital rocket system. On the architectural scale, uh, uh, using a different material system, biopolymers, uh, we're, we're happy to present Agoroja 3. Biopolymers and the living systems they comprise outperform human engineering, not only through their efficiency and diversity of functions, but also through their renewability. So here we digi digitally designed and synthesized various blends of cellulose, chitosan, cornstarch, pectin, and calcium carbonate to elicit specific thermal, mechanical, and optical properties. Endowing a novel biocement with precise and tunable material properties that perform predictably at multiple scales. These artifacts represent six years of exploration and deep research into computationally grown and robotically manufactured biocomposites that together make up a library of functional biopolymers enabling biocompatible design and construction from the molecular scale to the architectural scale. And here's the new Agoroja 3 pavilion currently being constructed for uh, our SFMOMA show. Um, in this pavilion, precision of the robotic fabrication process allows us to specify high resolution gradients of material distribution and geometry. Where precision, uh, yes, so in February, the structure's first series will be uh, decomposed at SFMOMA actually on the rooftop. Uh, we will monitor this decomposition and use it as a live experiment of design by decay that informs our models uh, for the decay of future structures and artifacts. So in February, the structure's first series will be decomposed. We will monitor this decomposition and use it as a live experiment that informs um, our models. A real-time display of the calories remaining in the structure and those returned to the soil will accompany the exhibition. The 40,000 calories embodied in this structure of skin will be consumed by soil bacteria and local organisms, fueling new growth that will ultimately reinforce the production of the very same materials that brought it to be. We're laser focused on data-driven analysis and construction and our evaluation go well beyond typical life cycle assessments, quantifying even the energy required by natural processes to create these raw materials. For a structure such as Agohoja 1, we quantify the amount of sunlight, rain, and wind required to produce the material stock that ultimately became cellulose, pectin, and chitin. Even with a relatively small structure on the architectural scale, the material footprint of the design is inherently cosmopolitan, drawing on resources from across the globe. This global footprint currently actually being analyzed by our last student at Mediated Matter, Nick uh, Lee Hogan, is as much part of the structure as the parts that we can see and feel. Understanding the supply chains required to produce any structure are critical information when striving to create sustainable designs. 
Finally, on the urban scale, we're looking at designing by growth. Uh, the project is called the Future of Manhattan and will also be uh, debuted in um, SFMOMA. Um, and this project takes us uh, from New York back to New York. So before Europeans arrived in New York um, in 1609, the land was home to the Lenape people and was named, Man was named Manahata, the land of many hills. It had over 55 different ecological communities on a territory of only 20 square miles, home to the mammals, birds, fish, plants, fungi, and bacteria. Drawing on typological history and technological futures, both good and bad, we ask, can structures and cities utilize the traces of species and cultures that have been demolished for them to be built on, restoring ecological balance? Deploying computational growth strategies now on an urban scale, we examine a special site with unique hazard zone predictions and ecological implications, juxtaposing 2021 with 1609 to examine the duality between grids and rivers, urban zoning and ecological niches that are about to go extinct. Employing a mega nature approach uh, to urban design rather than a mega structures approach, to reverse grow what was once lost and cater for climatic perils to come while enabling high density living across urban and also across architectural scales. The Manahata models will be on show uh, as well at the SFMOMA in February, and they will be shown as a continuum that spans four centuries from 20, 2100 to 2400, uh, each representing an urban era in the process of reclaiming nature without compromising the art of building near carbon zero interventions. With climate change overturning the established norms of design, science and engineering, we enlist a set of values to guide our research and our design work for the next 15 years, and I should say the next 150 years. Placed against the backdrop of Lawrence Halpern's 1960s ideals, we seek to create a viable synthesis, a synergy between the built and the grown. Striving towards a nature culture singularity where uh, we celebrate ethics as opposed to aesthetics, design empowerment as opposed to design control and so on. This approach calls into question the future of the architectural practice as a new kind of Bauhaus, uh, bringing together artists, scientists, engineers, and designers to design new values along, of course, with novel technologies and new kinds of structures. To rethink the synergy between nature and humanity, uh, here are our nine commandments. And um, with your blessing, I'll read them out aloud. Uh, you can find the entire write-up on the website and on our film uh, being featured today with Marcus and the, the Zine team. Um, so we call for a shift in how we perceive clientele and commercial viability, turning nature into a co-client within the design practice. With nature-centric design, we invite the creation and delivery of design solutions at the service of nature, while at the same time advancing humanity. The activist design approach that we seek to deploy utilizes technology stakes in urging commissioning corporations to implement nature-centric values across the design, construction, and manufacturing industries. System-centric design considers any design construct, wearable, product, or building a system of quantified interrelations across natural, biological, and digital domain. Platform technologies are the means to position the scientific method and technological innovation as the kernel of the architectural practice. So nature is client, nature-centric design, activist design, growth over assembly, system over object, technology over typology, difference over repetition, integration over segregation, and decay over disposal. Novel, novel design approaches demand novel spaces and new interdisciplinary communities akin to the Bell Labs in which scientific innovation was applied through engineering innovation to challenges affecting society. Or the space program revisited in the context of climate change, 
uh, with our planet uh, as its kernel. So um, right on time, uh, excited to be uh, speaking to you here, Marcus, uh, and uh, celebrating this new space uh, to build in uh, and to share uh, with nature, hopefully bringing nature and humanity uh, closer together uh, as we rethink the buildings and the cities of our future. Uh, so please write to us and visit our website and please feel free to apply to our new company. And we're, we're super excited about uh, hosting and, and having uh, anyone who's interested visit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neri. Do you want to unshare your screen? Yes. And quickly, you mentioned the, the film that we've published on Dazeen alongside your manifesto. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the film? What's in the film and what is it about? Yeah, so I met Ron Milo, Professor Ron Milo, I should say, from the Weizmann Institute in Israel. I met him via online um, through a shared colleague of ours at, at the Wies Institute. Um, and, and Ron asked me a simple question. He, he said, um, uh, can you envision at what time uh, human um, anthropomass, meaning the mass produced by humans, uh, including buildings, cities, and products, uh, will supersede or exceed the amount of biomass on our planet? And I said, well, um, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 100 years from now. And he said, no, it's 2020. It's this year. This was in 2020 when we had the conversation. Um, my daughter was, uh, you know, a year old, and I felt this uh, urgent need to, uh, to attack this problem. And no longer could I see the practice as a design practice that continues to create commission design in the tradition of an architectural practice. But uh, I, I sort of was called upon by Ron and his team at Weizmann to, uh, to, to rethink how we design today. And so we put together this film um, and the film uh, celebrates the work of the Mediated Matter Group uh, over a period of, I think, over 10 years uh, worth of work. And it takes you through, um, we, we sort of classified the, the various project by material system or by materials. And for each material, we also show a, a technology that corresponds to it. Um, and we take you through uh, transitions in scale and how those might impact uh, the built environment for the better. Um, with that in mind, we project towards the future and ask, well, how might these technologies that were dev uh, devised, developed, and implemented in the context of a, an academic program, you know, where we write research papers, we publish scientific uh, and peer-reviewed scientific publications, we show our work at art galleries, how can we take this work to the real world and make real impact uh, in a scale that is meaningful? Again, not designing a building or a set of products, but really realigning the entire design industry uh, to operate in a way that it that can make a difference in, 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 in manufacturing and how we make things across scales, across application domains, across verticals. So the film really celebrates this work and, and it is a long film, it's 31 minutes long, um, but hopefully you can uh, enjoy uh, the summary of 10 years and 30 minutes. And, um, and so the, the manifesto, is, does that in a way, it, it gives, you, gives you a sort of guiding staff for the work that you're going to do? You're, it, it, fundamentally, you're proposing that using design to kind of heal the rift between humanity and nature, learn tricks from nature so that we grow all the things that we need, and then they decompose afterwards, and, and then nurture nature again. Is, is that kind of in a nutshell what you're proposing? Well, it will require, I mean, these, you no, know, it, it took, what, 60 years to move from the transistor to the personal computer. These changes will take time. They will take more than 15 years, right? This is more than a 15 year manifesto. It will take, could take 150 years, right? And I always say as designers, if we're designing things we'll see in our lifetime, it's, it's not worth investing in them. And this is part and parcel of who we are uh, as, 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 a new, uh, as a new practice. So not only is it, is it a poetic uh, uh, statement about bringing nature and humanity together, uh, and, and there are, again, this is a continuum, there are lots of questions, it's a very, very charged area, right? Are humans part of nature? Or are, is there a nature, right? Some may claim nothing, nothing in our world is natural any longer. So there are lots of um, nuances in, in how we define all of these actors in this grand scheme of, you know, uh, living on our planet, simulation or not. 
Um, but, uh, but I think this is definitely more than, than a, a design practice. This is a new 21st century Bell Labs that, that, that is asking uh, of designers to act as policymakers in the UN, that is asking of designers to act as scientists of the future, as technologists of the future, and that really builds a new space for thinking and making um, in, in the age of climate change. And I think I like the, the example of the Bell Labs because what war, what Second World War did for, um, for Mervyn Kelly and his team at, at the Bell Labs uh, is sort of what climate change is doing for us, right? So, so if you think about all the inventions that came from Bell Labs during, uh, during its period, uh, in four years during the, the, the war, um, they have come up with the most incredible inventions um, you know, from the transistors to uh, growing synthetic crystals in the lab, um, you know, because in the 1930s in South America, they were uh, becoming rare and rare. So, so it's this crisis brings us to, towards invention. And I think there's a real opportunity now uh, because ironically, the design goods that we design are the ones that are creating the rift. Just another statistics, which is really, really interesting. Um, we have, uh, if I remember correctly, a thousand gigatons of trees and shrubs on this planet. We have 1,100 um, gigatons of built environment, building and infrastructure in the environment. So again, while we, our mass is relatively small on life on earth, the, the stuff we build as architects and urban designers and product designers is really uh, creating a damage um, um, uh, that, you know, for which we're now seeking other planets. But I think there's still hope, but I think we have to act quickly and to completely realign and re-question what design is and how design should be. And we have a lot of baggage, both literally and metaphorically. And, and another statistic I heard recently is that apparently we build uh, a city the size of New York every week. So this mountain of stuff you're talking about is, is getting bigger. What will happen to that though? Okay, let's, let's assume that your, your vision starts to its journey of 150 years to, to give us a new way of, of, of building stuff. But in the meantime, all that other stuff, the concrete and the steel and the glass and everything is still there. What happens to that? It's okay. Um, the, these things ha will happen in parallel, right? We will not be able to completely reinvent uh, uh, steel and glass. And these things will happen in parallel. Um, I think we, we need to think about ways in which to uh, recycle what has already been constructed uh, and reconsider this, you know, the circular economy as the ultimate material ecology where anything and everything that we design is, uh, I guess, the intention of, of, of the design that goes into a designed product, be it a building or a product, um, carries the same significance in its decay. And that's exactly what we're doing with our recent set of pavilions. Uh, but with all the rest of the stuff, look, um, there is a lot of beauty in what humanity has created so far. Uh, and, um, and with, you know, with, with the positive attitude, and uh, uh, I, I'm sure that, you know, we can come up with the right kind of policy and, and we will need a lot of policy around these issues uh, to limit the amount of materials that we use and how we use those materials in the context of the built environment. Um, it's not a question of or, it is, it is really a question of end. A lot of people go into architecture and design because they want to put things on the planet. And if you think back into history, like the pyramids of ancient Egypt and the, the temples of Greece and, and so on and so forth, I mean, somebody made those um, somebody wanted to be remembered for them and we're very glad that they did because we can look back and, and see what civilization was capable of in the past in your future if it all kind of rots away at the end of it where there won't be anything for people to to be remembered by and there won't be anything for generations past that to look back on it's a different kind of sensitive sensibility i think uh, it's a change of mindset and that's why i use the word humanity and not humans uh, humanity is, is, is a whole that's bigger than the sum of its part, that's bigger than the sum of its humans. And maybe it is time for us to, uh, to reconsider what we leave behind. Um, I'm, I'm often inspired by the world of cinema and the world of music. Um, and, and, you know, my childhood was mostly informed and inspired by those pieces of cinema and music and definitely a uh, pieces of nature that I've, you know, cherished uh, throughout my lifetime. Uh, 
um, that are you know that are non-material uh, and and have defined who I am uh, to this date. And and now I have a sense or I feel a sense of responsibility because where I am in life um, uh, to make to make a, a positive change for, for the better. Uh, but I'm you're right. A... You're right. It's it's a very 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 interesting question. Um, you know, how do we now inform human, you know, human impact and human legacy on the planet? And I think that the answer is probably if we work with nature, we will be able to, uh, you know, come up with new kinds of pyramids, new kinds of footprints for human civilization that finds this kind of synergy between grown and made. It, it'll, it'll, I think, be of the same scale, but of a, a different kind of sensitivity and sensibility. And a lot of the things, uh, a lot of what drives this is, is human ego as well. I mean, a lot of the manifestos that we've been presented, people have been saying that we need to, we need to get rid of our ego because the, the, that desire to, to leave your mark is a very well, often male ego thing. Uh, as Devlin said on the first day in her manifesto, that designers were increasingly wanting to, to plant gardens rather than putting a, a monument on the earth. They wanted to, to, to restore nature it seems like this is something in the air and a lot of people are thinking along similar lines i think that's true and there's a lot to be said about uh and i love as by the way i miss her and i'm so so glad to have had her give the first manifesto and, and sort of end with this i think there's a lot of correlation uh in in our thinking um but yes i you know i i think um um you know, speaking as a mother, one must uh, constantly, um, constantly, uh, and simultaneously edit and rethink uh, on the fly. And 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 I think that again, that kind of sensibility um, is um, is a feminine one, if I may, uh, and um, and one that requires editing design as opposed to top down implementing or imposing. Uh, and 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 and. and I think that if nature really does call for a understanding of what can we do as designers to encourage the relationship between bottom-up growth processes, natural processes that we know we can quantify, we can predict, and top-down templating of these natural growth processes. So as opposed to saying, this is a top-down shape, we say, here's a top-down method for how to grow that shape into being. And that's, that's that shift in mindset. I'll also say that, I mean, that shift in, in kind of putting the ego aside and, and calling humanity to, to step up to nature, um, you know, requires a different kind of sensibility to, you know, towards each other. <laughs> we need more empathy in this world. We need uh, worlds in which uh, design and indeed design business or the business of design um, is activist uh, in, in the sense that we can point onto companies and corporations that are proceeding with design goods that are toxic or proceeding with design goods that uh, compromise uh, human civilization and indeed nature. And so um, we're not only designing goods, of course, we're designing technologies, but we're also designing relationships and we're designing communities and we're designing ways of being in the world. And that is so, so, so important. As you said, you've shifted from academia into to private practice. Um, does that mean that the kind of objectives of your work will change? Do you feel, will you feel a kind of pressure to build things that have functions? Um, you showed a project that was a cinema. Is that an actual cinema that's going to be built that people watch films in? So, I, so uh, I'll, I'll answer and then I, I'll give a clarification about the cinema. Um, I feel the pressure. Uh, I feel the pressure and have felt the pressure for, you know, the two years we've been working on the design um, plans and sections for the space behind me that hopefully in a year's time we'll be bustling with scientists, engineers and designers working together. Uh, but yes, I've been feeling the pressure, of course, of, um, you know, how do we take these, this design vision and place it in a context of revenue generation that keeps us sustainable for ions, you know, to come. Um, and, and how do we think about a, a business model that retains the purity of these design ideation while still uh, enabling us to be self-sustaining, but also contribute to a positive change in the world? So this requires a new business model. It re requires a set of new technologies that we have been working on secretly and we're in stealth mode. I'm super excited. I'll, 
you'll be the first one to know Marcus. Um, uh, and, and so we're, we're, we're working hard on, on these uh, core technologies that we believe will really, really change the face of design and in parallel will allow us to, um, uh, to, to, to design good. So I'd say right now we're quote unquote posing as a design company, uh, but actually acting as a technology company in the background. And there will be a time when it'll be the opposite, where we'll, we'll, we'll be sort of technology facing and design uh, uh, in, in the background. So it, it, the relationship is very interesting. Clarification about the cinema. So uh, I haven't, um, I haven't actually clarified. So the the um, the cinema is a, a project that started several years ago. Actually, um, started thinking about it at the Media Lab, um, and have been wanting for a while to scale uh, the Gemini um, to building scale. So this was sort of a, a, a labor of love kind of project um, that will show will be showcasing at SFMOMA. But in the context of that project, the Manhattan project. Uh, was uh, actually inspired by Megalopolis, a um, new film uh, that Francis Ford Coppola has been working on for the past 20 years uh, and hoping to film in the coming year. Um, and and we, we feel very, very honored to be working with uh, Francis on a new vision for New York City uh, across scale. So the urban design models that you've seen and, and, and the cinema hopefully will be featured in the film pointing towards a future of that kind of synergy between nature and, and humanity, which is very much part of the film. Um, beyond that, of course, we're looking into uh, working with large companies uh, to create goods, again, across scales. So we won't be focused only on architecture or only on product design, but across different verticals. And key for us would be to be very, very selective in terms of which companies we choose to work with in order to produce which product in order to generate what kind of environmental change that we want to see in the world. Um, so it will require a new kind of business model and, and we're, we're super excited about it. So maybe in a few years time, I'll be able to buy a, a Neri Oxman house, which maybe will grow itself. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds kind of, it sounds almost um, cinematic, the kind of ambition that you're, you're talking about. When you were talking about how you're gonna have this bustling lab full of people revealing sacred technologies i was i was thinking about iron man there's, there's iron man and then the real world equivalent is oxman it's sort of it is a kind of <laughs> film script in a way yeah that's why the oxman actually works for today again the o symbolizes nature x symbolizes the multiplicity sign and and man um, or woman uh, uh symbolizing humanity um, but look, the, there's, I love cinema. I've always loved cinema, uh, love, love the music world as well. And, uh, and, 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 um, and at my core, I, and I think this is true for all of my team members, we want to live um, sort of dead center between speculative design and affirmative design. We don't want to give either up, right? We want to be able to write scientific papers, go for, I, I mean, the, the Bell Labs generated nine Nobel laureate, nine Nobel uh, prizes, nine Nobel laureates came from the Bell Labs during a time of war. This is really, really exciting um, that one can actually progress science and technology through design. Uh, and so we'd like to do that. But at the same time, we realize that we have a responsibility um, and I should say Oxman is a B corporation. So sustainable goals that relate to sustainable and social good are at the heart of our mission. And, uh, and, and at the same time, again, we, we realize that we need to uh, leverage our speculative design ideation spirit to enable real change and, uh, and generate revenue such that we can then reinvest that revenue and continue to do research. Uh, so we're hoping uh, to do both speculative and affirmative design, um, you know, side by side, depending on the company that we're working on. We're looking now, we, we already have two or three companies that we're talking to all in very, very different spaces. Uh, and we're, we're excited to, to share with you when, when we're ready, the, the new kinds of products that we're thinking of in bringing this vision closer to reality or a little bit closer to reality. So no, we won't be able to grow a home from a seed just yet. Um, but we're, we're getting pretty darn close. And just let's talk briefly about the aesthetic of the, the future. The projects that you've worked on, they, they have a kind of look which is uh, very science fiction or very like 
or organic, but sort of primitively organic looking. Is that like a, is that because they turn out like that? Or is that some, you're directing the way that these things look and have come up with this sort of, I keep thinking about the film Alien or H.R. Geiger or something like that. It's kind of sinuous and, and, um, and roots like. It's interesting that uh, the other night we were watching with our, uh, with our daughter, we were watching in nature uh, a documentary about coral reefs and octopi. And watching this, we, we felt like we were in a sci-fi movie and it just nature is incredibly imaginative and beautiful and, and, and sci-fi like. And these, these two coral reefs fighting for resources, um, uh, just looking at those uh, in high resolution, uh, uh, wide angle photography underwater was so, so incredibly inspiring. And so when, when you actually go deep in resolution uh, into nature, it does feel like sci-fi. I'm reminded of Bucky Fuller's uh, quote about beauty. You know, I, I, beauty goes something to the extent of uh, beauty never guides our work, uh, but at the end of the project, when we look at something that's not beautiful, we know it's wrong. And so I think the aesthetic value or the aesthetic, uh, um, uh, how should I say, it, uh, sensitivity is not imposed, but it's sort of, it emerges uh, as part of the project. And when it emerges, we look at it and we feel it out and we know that it's right. So, so I think similar to Bucky Fuller's uh, insights on aesthetic, uh, similarly our team with respect to uh, how these projects look and feel and behave, um, you know, are, is, is a reflection on, on where, where nature uh, perhaps wishes to go and where it always was aesthetically. And not from watching too many sci-fi films. And, and finally, I wanted to, to, to take the conversation sideways a little bit. I mean, a lot of people are thinking about how we will live, not in the physical world, but in a digital world, in the metaverse. I mean, your work is very much grounded in bees and caterpillars and, and spiders and the kind of the, 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 the natural world, the real world. But what are your thoughts on the parallel world that's emerging that some people say might provide us with a, an escape route away from the problems of the earth or, or where we could also create a paradise whilst the world burns around us. Yeah, I, 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 I think it's interesting to note the changes that are happening in the world. I think the metaverse um, uh, um, is, is an, sort of an interesting exercise in repackaging the singularity uh, or the technological singularity uh, taking us to a, sort of a new level of being able to um, to grapple with uh, cloud-based consciousness that can be um, you know that can be rocketed into Mars and continue our civilization there uh, uh, in the absence of our physical bodies. Uh, but I think with um, the Wild West around the moon landing, the new moon landing missions uh, to, you know, to create civilizations and moons and Mars. Uh, I, I think there is a deep need to go back in order to look forward. And I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, with the metaverse is producing, I think, infinitesimally um, more egos <laughs> in the universe. And if, if you look at what, um, what is happening today in, in social media, uh, there is uh, there's quite lack of empathy, I, I believe, um, and and a kind of a, a compromise of, of empathy and love between people, right? So the more ads, the angrier you get, the more uh, the more likes you get, the more consumed you are by the media, etc. And in a world which unites humans in nature, you actually need to slow down. You actually need to take a moment and listen to the birds and the bees, and you actually need to. Um, you know, extend your senses and expand your heart and, you know, in order to, you know, to, to, to smell the rose or the daisy. And I think that kind of sensibility uh, uh, requires a slowing down sort of the opposite of the, uh, the, the, the metaverse. The ads will get to the metaverse, but they can't get to a daisy, right? So uh, we, need, we need to go back, back to the daisies. That's a, a brilliant, brilliant and beautiful haiku-like ending to our, our conversation. Thank you so much, Nari. You've put Thank in the you, Marcus. Of Always a pleasure. Into the Thank you. I hope you enjoy the film. Thank you for posting it. I'm, I'm so, so grateful for you and your team uh, and for your integrity about design content.
content and so, so excited to, to see you in person when you next hit the city. I'll be there. And thank you so much for finishing our Design 15 birthday festival on such a, an amazing and optimistic note. Thank you very Always. much. Always. Happy birthday. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.